Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing of our worship of you on this your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For by your divine Spirit and by your sacred word, our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Hello everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Over the past month or so, uh, the number one, by far, topic of questions, comments, and rants uh, that I've received has shifted to God's fourth commandment. Uh, I've been amazed and heartened uh, by the number of people who really do know what the fourth commandment is genuinely about, uh, what the Holy Bible actually says about it, and are now starting to do something about it, if they hadn't already. Uh, They just seem to need a little help to do what many already knew was the right thing to do. Uh, It's like that man in the Quaker Oats commercial who says it's the right thing to do. Uh, That was an effective commercial because many people already knew that it was the right thing to do, uh, but just needed a little moral reinforcement. Uh, It's the same principle, I think. Along that line, uh, from what I've been told, many have sort of hesitated uh, to do something, uh, the right thing, with the knowledge that they had, simply because they felt somewhat alone and isolated. And, And that's normal from what I've seen as well. Very often, very often, just one person in a family will will awaken to what the Word of God actually and truthfully says about the Fourth Commandment, and and that can be a hard thing sometimes, for a while. Uh, It can take a lot of patience and a lot of love to wait for a loved one uh, who has yet to come around. Um, It's also a, a delicate time because you can't argue someone into the truth. Rarely. Uh, In fact, it it just almost always has the opposite effect by making people become defensive. Uh, That's human nature. Rarely, though, uh, from what I've seen anyway, more than one person in a family, uh, a husband and a wife, for example, will come to the realization of the truth at the same time. And and that is truly a blessing when that happens. Uh, Those who who have it that way uh, should regard themselves as being very fortunate because it usually doesn't work out that way. Um, But really, much of what I've heard is just a matter of people being heartened by the knowledge that they are not alone in what they already knew or strongly suspected was the truth, even though they they may be physically distant uh, from their brothers and sisters who have that same awareness. I mean, if you study the Bible, you're going to reach that conclusion you're going to become aware of it, or at least strongly suspect it. Um, The Internet, although uh, it is misused by many, uh, is really also proving to be a very useful tool uh, for not only preaching the true gospel, but also as a way to permit God's people to gather together in a way uh, when they don't have a, a local place to go. Uh, I've heard from so many people that I've never actually met, but who I really feel as though I know. And and they are here today, too. We're here. Together. Um, In an attempt to answer some of the questions that I received, though, uh, this week's sermon uh, is entitled, How Should We Observe God's Fourth Commandment? Uh, I hope that you find it useful. Some uh, have begun uh, asking for the script or or transcript uh, of these sermons. Um, They are apparently uh, used to the written uh, daily Bible study and and would like to have a written copy uh, of these sermons. Um, As far as a script is concerned, uh, in what I use when I'm doing them, uh, all that I actually have is these notes, uh, which is really just a listing of the points that I want to cover. Uh, along with a a general time outline so that I get done within the allotted time. Um, 
also it has uh, the scripture references that I print out from uh, from a computer beforehand, uh, which I I do simply because it's otherwise very difficult uh, to remember all of the chapter and verse numbers. Um, plus, it saves a little time by having them already printed out uh, rather than having to go searching for them as they're needed. So I don't have a script uh, in that sense. Uh, if, in fact, uh, if I were to repeat this sermon as soon as I did it the first time, it wouldn't be the same. Uh, the main points would be, but it's not like a word-for-word a -word set script, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, transcripts, however, may be something that we could do um, if people wanted them uh, after it's done uh, to type out or transcribe what was, uh, what was done uh, in the sermon. Uh, but we don't have that either uh, as of right now since uh, that's just a new suggestion uh, that we haven't had time to do anything about yet. But uh, we might do that if only for those who, who for some unforeseeable reason uh, cannot access the audio sermons. Uh, that's another consideration. Uh, so we will look into that. Um, also, I'd like to add briefly to what I mentioned last week about our email filter. Um, it generally does not, does not, allow attachments through. Uh, that's how viruses almost always come uh, and the filter is very aggressive about attachments. Uh, it just doesn't let them through. Um, so if you have something that absolutely must be sent by attachment, uh, send just a regular email first and we'll see if we can give you um, an alternate email address uh, that is not generally public uh, and therefore not inundated uh, as our main Pathfinder uh, address is. The news this week saw Canada's corrupt liberal government survive a confidence vote uh, yesterday, Thursday, by just one vote. The Speaker of the House of Commons was called upon to break a 152 to 152 vote tie and he supported the continued survival of the minority liberal government. Uh, otherwise, we would have been into another federal election in this country uh, here today. Um, the reason that I use the adjective corrupt in describing the Liberal Party here is because of the testimony that has been made and continues to be made uh, in an ongoing public inquiry into how millions of dollars, uh, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, of taxpayers' money uh, was misused by the governing liberals. Uh, the amount of taxpayers' money involved there just seems to be mind-boggling. Um, but the liberals still seem to be seem to have very little sense of financial responsibility, uh, as again uh, made evident just this month, uh, when in order to get the support uh, of a small sub-liberal fringe party uh, for that confidence vote yesterday. The Liberals made a budget deal with that little fringe party that cost the Canadian taxpayers another four or five billion, not million, billion dollars, uh, just so the Liberals could hang on uh, by hook or by crook uh, a few more months in office. Uh, the Conservative Party leader here called it a deal with the devil, and I think he was right uh, in principle. Uh, I never thought that I would see the politics of this beloved nation uh, reach such a putrid level. Uh, and what amazes me is that there are still so many people here who say that they would still vote for the Liberals uh, if an election were held now. It's really bizarre. Um, you might be asking yourself what that has to do with the Bible or, or this daily Bible study, uh, but the corrupt Liberals, uh, apart from their general anti-Bible attitude, are also responsible for impending legislation here that may permit uh, the so-called marriage uh, of homosexuals, uh, which if you know anything at all about the Word of God, uh, you know how wrong that is. Uh, in the eyes of God, in God's eyes, uh, according to God's own words. Um, but the liberals uh, don't care about that, obviously, because they are also responsible, ominously responsible, uh, that's why I mention them here, uh, for legislation that is now in force in this country. It's the law now, uh, where this ministry resides uh, that theoretically classifies parts of the Holy Bible as so-called hate literature. Uh, as ridiculous as you know that is, uh, primarily the parts of the Holy Scriptures that say that the sodomite lifestyle is evil. Uh, so, 
Now anyone who quotes God's word about that uh, may be committing a crime. Um, so, but if the government ever started actually prosecuting people for quoting the Bible, uh, they would be setting themselves up for an absolute legal farce. Uh, imagine, if you can, a bizarre situation of someone maybe having to go on trial for preaching the actual Word of God as written in the Holy Bible, going into a courtroom, walking up to the witness stand, putting their hand on a Bible that I understand is still there in Canadian courtrooms, swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then being prosecuted, or, or should I say persecuted, for actually believing and teaching what's in that very same Bible from which they just swore to tell the truth. It's just bizarre. But it could happen to somebody because God's true servants here or anywhere else in the world are never going to be gagged by anyone. Never. Uh, trying to make God parts of God's word into illegal so-called hate literature is just is of course just a satanic attempt to put a gag order on the Holy Bible, on the truth. Uh, Satan has been at that for a long time, but it's something that the devil isn't going to win. He never has and he never will. Uh, sodomite behavior is evil and is abominable. And if I just committed a crime by saying that, I can't help it. Because that's what God says. Uh, if they want to arrest me for simply teaching and preaching the truth of what the Bible actually says, so be it. I'd much rather that it didn't happen, but whether or not it does is up to the government. Whatever they want to do, fine. I'm here, I'm not hard to find. But I'm not going to start uh, telling lies or start hiding the, the truth of Almighty God because of some corrupt government. Uh, but if they ever start arresting God's servants for merely quoting God, uh, they are inviting God's wrath upon themselves. God will deal with them. His servants needn't do anything. God will deal with them. The Holy Bible is not hate literature. That's, that's, that's just absurd. The Holy Bible is a way to life. It's a warning to all who commit all sorts of vile behavior, including the sodomites, that if they don't repent, they are headed for the lake of fire. It's not too late for the sodomites if they repent. For example, from 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But ye are washed, you are sanctified, you, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Anyone who refuses to repent of their sin, including violating the fourth commandment, as we shall see in the main sermon after this musical interlude, is not going to be granted salvation. That's just reality. It's not hate literature. That's just what the Bible plainly says. And the Bible specifically says that sodomy is a grievous sin. Unrepentant sodomites are headed for the lake of fire, along with, and just as surely as, our unrepentant, lying and thieving politicians of any political party. Imagine a hypothetical situation where a man, just in his normal life's activities, whether in a business of some sort, or perhaps change that he was given somewhere when he bought something, comes into, into the possession of a $50 bill, a counterfeit $50 bill. Now, this man was not the counterfeiter. He was a good, honest, decent, law-abiding citizen who was the victim of a crime, a deception, 
by having been given that counterfeit money. He was not the counterfeiter, and neither was the person who gave it to him, nor was the person who gave it to that person. The bill had been in circulation for quite a long time, uh, since the counterfeiter originally passed it to his first victim long before. It had fooled a lot of people. It was, in fact, such a well-crafted fake that it even deceived experts, some experts, who had contact with it as well. Despite the fact that it really wasn't worth anything, that it, in fact, was worse than just worthless, this man honestly thought that he had fifty dollars. Uh, if he had lost his wallet, he would have felt quite bad about it because, apart from everything else of value commonly found in a wallet, he would have thought that he had lost that fifty dollars because it was real to him. And if he had been robbed of it, he would have went to the police and the police would have done everything in their power to catch the robber and to protect that man's rights even though by doing so they too would be victims, wouldn't they? Not in the matter of seeking the robber but they would be seeking unknowingly to recover something that was itself unlawful. Now, imagine that man had a son and the son's birthday was coming up. Like a lot of people, this man wasn't very good at shopping for gifts, but he thought, well, I'll give my son that $50, and he can then do with it as he likes. And that's what he did. On his son's birthday, the father gave his son that $50 bill and wished him a happy birthday. The son was quite happy. I mean, $50 is a nice gift. But the son now became the possessor of that counterfeit money. Like his father, he was an honest, law-abiding man who would never, never knowingly do anything illegal. But he was now holding something that was very illegal. Now, this man loved his father. They had many wonderful memories together, and as people sometimes do with letters or, or keepsakes of some sort, that very day the son decided to start a family tradition with that $50 bill that he, like his father, thought was genuine. When the time came, he decided that he would give it to his son. So that $50 bill then became something more. It became a family tradition. And when the time came, he did give it to his son, who became thereby the third possessor in that family of that counterfeit $50 bill. So, generation after generation, good, honest people perpetuated something that was in fact not good and not honest. They weren't criminals, but they were unknowingly perpetuating a crime, a deception, a fraud. Then, imagine something happened. The grandson, the third son who was the possessor of that counterfeit $50 bill, discovered that it was a fake. Not because he was any smarter than his father or grandfather, or because he was in any way more honest or good than they were. It simply happened that he was the one to make the discovery, as someone was bound to do sooner or later. Unlike his father or grandfather, however, this son then knew the truth about that $50 bill. And unlike his father and grandfather, who would not be regarded as criminals for giving that phony bill to others, there has to be some sort of criminal intent. The son, this son, would be a criminal, because he knew. If he then used it, or even continued to possess it, he would be guilty of a crime. But he also knew that what the bill had become. 
the family tradition that it involved, even though no one had known that it was a fake. It began to represent something beyond what it actually was, even if it had been real. So the son was between that well-known rock and a hard place, but he knew he had to do something. Since the son was a law-abiding as his father and grandfather were, there was really only one thing that he could do to take it to the police. He could perhaps have just burned it, <clears throat> but he wondered if that itself might be a crime, destroying evidence that perhaps could be used to catch the counterfeiter. So he took it to the police and went through all of that. Later, he went to his father and broke the news to him and showed him the proof the in undeniable proof that that treasured keepsake cake was a fake. Now, he expected that his father would be angry because the son himself was quite angry. And he was right. His father did become very angry, but not in the way that the son expected. Rather than being angry at the counterfeiter, the one who created the, that deception long ago, the father became very angry with his son for, he said, ruining a family tradition that had then existed for generations. Tradition had become more important than truth. Now, as I said, that was all just an analogy, but of something that's very real. It's an analogy for how God's fourth commandment has been counterfeited and how good, honest, faithful people have been victimized victimized by that fraud generation after generation and generation by generation. Many of you well know the truth of that analogy because you've experienced it, haven't you? or you are experiencing it, some of you. You can probably put names on the people in that analogy from your own experience with the Sabbath and Sunday, just as I can. I spent the first half of my life, the first 25 years of my life, as a Sunday keeper. I went to church on Sunday, and I have many memories of Sunday life, wonderful memories. And I also remember what I used to think about those who observed God's one and only true Sabbath. But I've now become one of the very sort of people that I used to mock. But that scorn is also part of the counterfeit. It keeps people from looking for the truth and to the truth. It keeps them just blindly accepting a tradition from generation to generation without ever proving it for themselves. There's nothing wrong with family traditions or traditions in general as long as they don't disobey God's law. Sunday, when observed as the Christian day of worship, is a counterfeit, a fake, a fraud, and I can prove it to you. Deceivers may demand blind faith, but God doesn't. Many people, when they encounter a Christian who observes the Seventh-day Sabbath, which by definition is really the only Sabbath there is, because there is only one true God, one God of creation, react by thinking of one particular Sabbath-keeping church organization or another. But there are really, actually, many Sabbath-keeping Christian church organizations, uh, most of which are completely independent and unassociated with one another, and all of which, uh, at the very most, have existed for only a century or two. But many people think that the Sabbath observance uh, originated with them, uh, with some man-made or woman-made church organization, as though observing God's commanded holy day was somehow a doctrine 
that that particular church invented. It's just very faulty logic. In truth, the Sabbath has existed before it was even officially rendered as the fourth commandment for the Israelites at Sinai, because it existed right from the time of creation, before there were even any Israelites around, before the Israelites existed. The Sabbath wasn't a creation of Israelites or Jews or any Christian church that observes the Seventh-day Sabbath today. But it was a creation of God. Almighty God was the first Seventh-day Sabbath keeper. He created it and made it holy and sanctified, as plainly stated in Genesis 2, 1-3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The first humans to observe the Sabbath were Adam and Eve. Their only religious affiliation was that they knew and worshipped the only true God. Their fall, their sin, came later with the tree of the garden, not with defiling the day that God himself had sanctified and made holy. All through the Bible, thereafter, all through Bible history, God's true people observed the true God's holy day. None of God's true people observed Sunday. But that doesn't mean that Sunday, sun worship, wasn't observed since very ancient times long before Christianity. It was a pagan day of worship since very, very early times. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. As stated in those verses, God made the sun to be a great light. And to the ancient people, who didn't know God, the sun was the center of their life. And they began to worship it. Since the most ancient times, the sun has been a favorite god, so-called, or god symbol, of pagan people all around the world. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Greeks... And the Romans all had their sun gods, in one form or another. Sometimes the names were even the same. The native people of North and South America widely practiced sun worship as well, as did their Asian ancestors. The Europeans, too, were deeply involved in sun worship, and many of their sun god festivals were carried over when they professed conversion to Christianity, as we shall see. These can still be seen today in the Easter bonfire and sunrise, sunrise, Easter services and the Christmas burning of the Yule log. Sun worship was also widely practiced by the people of the Middle East and even the Israelites, after they knew better, were sometimes corrupted by it, as stated in Ezekiel 8, 15-17. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? 
Now, many people, when they read that, can't understand how those Israelites could have done that. There they were, right in a holy place of God, like a church building today, involved in sun worship. How could they do that? Well, those of us who were brought up as Sunday keepers shouldn't be too quick to sit in judgment of them because the same sort of abomination, that's what God calls it, goes on today in Christian professing churches all over the world. And not just the day of worship, as we shall go on to examine fully. The walls of many Christian professing churches and homes are covered with images of pagan sun worship. The heads of saints uh, didn't really glow as is so often portrayed in all of that religious art in millions of churches and homes. The use of the halo or nimbus originated with the pagan Greeks and Romans to represent their sun god, Helios, as he was called, or it was called. Later artists adopted for use in Christian images. That's how it got, how it got there and how it originated. What many regard as Christian actually originated and was in widespread use long before Christianity by the pagans. It was pagan. They invented it and they made it what it is. A tool for sun worship. The supposedly Christian halo is actually just the sun behind the person's head. It's easy to recognize once one realizes what it is although it's often now stylized in one way or another to make it less obvious. It made its way into Christianity by sun-worshipping pagans who simply brought many of their pagan ideas along with them. And many artists, some without realizing it, perhaps most now without realizing it, have perpetuated the pagan nimbus or halo ever since. The Roman calendar that is used by much of the world today is also based on paganism that most people have been, in effect, trained to ignore the reality that the names that are used for the days of the week are all named after the sun, moon, or pagan gods. Sunday. I mean, that, that one's obvious. Monday is named after moon day. Named after the moon. Tuesday. Tues was a pagan god. Wednesday. Woden it, it was named after Woden, who was a pagan god. Thursday. Named after Thor, who was a pagan god. Friday is named after Freya, who was a pagan god. And Saturday, Saturn Day, was a pagan god. All were pagan, every one. Throughout the Bible, the days of the week were identified by number, from the first to the seventh. Only the seventh day was given a name by God, the Sabbath. That's what he called it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it shalt thou not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger within that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Exodus 28 to 10. As well, any day prior to a Sabbath, whether the regular weekly Sabbath or any of the annual Sabbaths, Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, was designed as a, designated as a preparation day. That is a very, very important point to remember, that so called preparation day before the Sabbath, because many in reading about Christ's crucifixion, assume that reference to preparation day before the Sabbath, when he was crucified, meant Friday, the day before the regular weekly Sabbath. But in fact, as we shall see, it was talking about the preparation day before the annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread at the time of Passover. The reason that many people try to call Friday afternoon to Sunday morning three days and three nights, when in fact it's only two nights in one day, is that there were two Sabbaths that week, the regular weekly 
Sabbath and the first day of unleavened bread. There were two preparation days because there were two Sabbaths that week. But we'll get to that. So how did Christianity, so many Christian professing people, go from God's true Sabbath to the pagan Sunday? Who was the counterfeiter? And how did he make it seem so real to so many people for so long? Generation after generation. The fourth commandment, God's fourth commandment, is to observe the seventh day Sabbath. We've gone through that now. It's plainly, plainly there in the Word of God. And all of the righteous people of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, including Jesus Christ himself, observed the Sabbath. Nowhere in the Bible, including after Christ's resurrection, will you find people observing the first day of the week, Sunday, as the replacement for the Sabbath. It's just not there. Most Sunday theologians readily admit, or rather simply cannot deny, they don't even try to deny what I just said, that all of the true people in the Bible, God's true people in the Bible, were Sabbath keepers. It's plainly written. That reality was even freely admitted by Roman Catholic Cardinal Gibbon in his classic Faith of Our Fathers. A quote of his own words, the words of a Roman Catholic Cardinal, a man who was one step from the papacy. He said, But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not, af- not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. End of quote. That's an amazing admission. So why do so many Christian professing churches use Sunday for the Sabbath? How did that happen? Essentially, Sunday worship is supposedly justified because of the assumption that Christ was resurrected on the first day of the week. Without a Sunday resurrection, there is no justification whatsoever for observing Sunday as a day of Christian worship or trying trying to make it into the Sabbath. As Sunday-keeping theologians readily admit, their entire defense of Sunday worship rests upon that assumption. But was Christ resurrected on a Sunday? As they say and desperately count on. No, he wasn't. Not according to the Holy Bible. We know that Christ was crucified on the day before a Sabbath, the preparation day. For example, as stated in Mark 15, 42-43. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Now many have assumed that meant Friday, and commonly refer to it as Good Friday. But the Bible record doesn't say that he was crucified on the day before the regular weekly Sabbath. It says that he was crucified before the annual Sabbath, the Passover, because Christ was the Passover, the Lamb of God. John 19.14 plainly states that the preparation day wasn't a regular Friday preparation day for the regular weekly Sabbath. It says, quote, And it was the preparation of the Passover. That preparation day was not, not a Friday, as the Word of God undeniably says, as we just read. It was not a Friday. Good Friday never happened. But we shall see which day it actually was. The only day that it actually could have been. Further, Christ said that the one and only proof that he was the Messiah was that he would be in the tomb for three days and three nights, which is 72 hours. From Matthew 12, 39 to 40, the Son of God himself plainly said, But he answered and said unto them, 
An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But Friday afternoon to Sunday morning is barely thirty-six hours, only two nights one day. Half the time is missing. Friday to Sunday simply doesn't work. Many people have come up with all sorts of flimsy arguments to try to make it seem so, to try to justify it in their own minds, or to anyone who would listen. But the Bible itself says that it could not possibly have been Friday afternoon to Sunday morning. That would have contradicted Christ's own words. When Peter, John, and Mary of Magdala arrived at the tomb early that Sunday morning, the resurrection had already occurred. It was still long before sunrise, because it was still dark, as the scriptures say, but the tomb was then already empty. From John 21. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulchre, and seeth the stone take o- taken away from the sepulchre. The idea that Christ came out of the tomb at sunrise, as millions have been taught to believe, is false, as we just read. It was yet dark, as the scriptures say, and yet the resurrection had already happened. So when did it happen? We know that Christ was placed in the tomb in late afternoon, near sunset, or even, as it is called in Matthew 2757. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Now, we know also that Christ would rise three days and three nights later, as he himself said would be the only proof that he was the Messiah. The only proof. Since he was placed in the tomb on a late afternoon, as we just read, he would therefore have been resurrected on a late afternoon, three days and three nights later, as he said would happen. That was his designation of time. He said that. Since he was already gone by Sunday morning, the first day of the week, as the scriptures also plainly say, he had to have risen the previous afternoon near sunset, on Saturday, not Sunday, three days and three nights from the time he was put there, on late afternoon. People didn't witness the resurrection because they stayed home during that Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, which was the third day. That's why Peter, John, and Mary found the tomb tomb empty early Sunday morning, while it was still dark. That's the true three days and three nights. The crucifixion was on a Wednesday afternoon, with the burial just before sunset, as the Bible says, and the resurrection was on the Sabbath afternoon, just before sunset. The resurrection occurred on the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. Jesus Christ was not resurrected on a Sunday morning or at any time during a Sunday. That's what your Bible says. Worship on the first day of the week cannot be justified by the facts as plainly stated in the Holy Bible. The justification for Sunday worship is riddled with error. Just riddled through and through. But who actually made Sunday the day of worship for so many Christian professing people in the first place? As already stated and proven, Sunday worship did not originate in the Bible or in the reality of the events of the crucifixion and resurrection. All of the first Christians, Peter, Paul, 
all of the apostles, Mary, Joseph, all of the people who wrote the Bible, and Jesus Christ himself, and God himself, were Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. That's what the Bible says. Everyone, everyone, all of them, no exceptions. So where did Sunday worship come from? Gradually, the Roman Empire that had crucified the Christ and persecuted Christians long after began to adopt Christianity, or rather, its own pagan-based version of Christianity, which was simply a blend of politics and religion. A little truth, but mostly outright Roman paganism, which included worship of the ancient Roman sun god. Sunday worship came about as a pagan corruption of God's holy seventh-day Sabbath. That's how the counterfeit originated. By the fourth century, only Jews. By then, God's, God's Sabbath was incorrectly becoming known as the Jewish Sabbath, along with a relatively few true Christians, continued to observe the seventh-day Sabbath as God commanded everyone, and as God himself observed and observes there is only one true God and one true Sabbath. In 321 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued an edict which outlawed work on the Roman pagan Venerable Day of the Sun, Sunday. And within three years, the corrupted version of Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire and the Roman Church. From that, the Roman Catholic Church and later many Pro its many Protestant daughter churches got the commonly accepted Sunday observance of today which is utterly pagan in origin and completely contrary to God's command. The historical evidence of that counterfeit change to Sunday worship is widely available to anyone who seeks the truth. It's a matter of history and it's a matter of biblical truth. It's there for anyone to see, anyone who wants to see the truth, because it is the truth. So, how do we actually go about observing the day? How do we observe God's fourth commandment? Well, let's look again at what God's fourth commandment actually says from Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now how can anyone find anything wrong with that? They shouldn't. Because you know, if you are or if you have been someone who has kept Sunday in a religious way, that is if you've been using the counterfeit, you already have a very good idea of how to observe God's fourth commandment. The only real difference is observing it in the right time. Local sunset Friday to local sunset Saturday. That is the true holy time. That's the only time when it is valid in God's sight. I personally now observe the Sabbath very much the same way that I used to observe Sunday. And don't get me wrong when I say that. I go to church here. I regard the day as unique and holy from the other days of the week. And I use it, put most simply, to take a break. As I said, Sunday-keeping people, most of them, have merely been the victims of a counterfeiter. When they replace the fake with what is genuine, then they rightfully and lawfully do with it what they thought they were doing with the counterfeit. Changing from the phony Sunday to God's true Sabbath isn't difficult. It's not. 
to answer the questions that people have been asking, uh, of course, there are some things that must be done on the Sabbath that would otherwise be regarded as work if it were possible to not have to do them on the Sabbath. For example, police officers, firefighters, doctors, nurses, and so on have to work on the Sabbath. And that is plainly stated as lawful in the scriptures. For example, um, from 2 Kings 11.7 regarding security forces. And two parts of you that shall go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. Uh, security has to be there. Police have to be there. Doctors and things happen. Uh, caring for children uh, or for others who depend on our caring for them is not unlawful on the Sabbath if the things that are done simply cannot be done before or after the Sabbath. That's the key. It's, it's having to do what genuinely has to be done. If it's a necessity, it would be unchristian not to do it. And generally, uh, buying and selling on the Sabbath is unlawful, simply because, unlawful in God's eyes, simply because it requires others to work. And it almost always can be done at some other time before or after God's holy day. I mean, the stores are open sometimes 24 hours a day now. You can go, go get your groceries at 4 o'clock in the morning at the store here locally, whenever you want. It's just a matter of common sense. Things like mowing the lawn on, on, on Saturday, which itself is almost like a religious tradition. I mean, you can hear the lawnmowers everywhere. is obviously work that could easily be done on some other time. It doesn't have to be done on the Sabbath. It's just a matter of simple common sense while obe obeying God. As is often the case, uh, if you are the first in your family to discover the truth, consider yourself fortunate. Uh, that may just mean that you will be in the first resurrection at Christ's return while your family members or your loved ones will be resurrected later. Uh, maybe. But whichever way it is or whichever way it turns out to be they too will come to at least know the truth and when they do all will be made right but but if you reject the truth of God's fourth commandment which you now know you're like that third son who knows who knows the truth they may just at that future time when they realized and accepted the truth of the Sabbath say to you you knew the truth but rejected it imagine that here we are now observing the truth now now that we know it well you refuse to repent wouldn't that be a tragedy they will come to know and obey while some who know now came to know but disobeyed. After Christ's return, the whole world is going to know and observe God's fourth commandment, as stated in Isaiah 66, 22-23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Ultimately, God's Sabbath has an even greater meaning and purpose, salvation. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entereth into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us there labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief the fourth commandment is the seventh day of the week that is the truth and you now know that it is the truth thank you for joining us for sabbath services this week you are being with us again makes our joy complete. We look forward to your gathering with us again next week on God's true holy day. Until then, may God bless you.